What is up, folks? It's the Emulsion Podcast, hosted by chef and media producer Justin Kana. That's me. The Emulsion is a result of my desire to educate, share, and personally keep myself up to date on stories stirring up the restaurant industry. I also sit down and interview remarkable professionals that are making exciting moves in their own unique and creative ways. Fine dining, chef swaps, new gear, critiques, professional performance, balance, hospitality, as well as the occasional rabbit hole are all just a few of the topics we get into here. With the goal, of course, being that you take off your headphones or get out of your car feeling smarter more inspired or more connected than when you pressed play. Where is the long ad read? You will not find that here because the growing gang of amazing folks on Patreon make it possible for me to hit the publish button every single Thursday and I'm eternally grateful for their support. But more on that after the show. Thank you for tuning into the show. It's super great to have you here. Hey, I hope you're having an awesome day. If not, there's always tomorrow. I don't, I don't know why that had to be said. Keep it all in perspective, you know? I am in Seoul, South Korea right now. This is the first, I want to say, the first international episode that's ever been recorded. I didn't want the fact that I was on the road to deter me from recording new episodes. I had a bunch of time during the flight to Japan to write this episode, and I want to get it sent off to get edited. So this is uh, my attempt to sit in kind of the hotel uh, closed restaurant for the day. There's like literally a selection of some incredible wines next to me. It's called Rubrica, um, and this place isn't open until 10 a.m. 10 a. It's still super early, so I'm trying to get this get this in. And also, quick reminder, I'm going to pitch it every episode until we hit episode 100. I want you to be a part of episode 100. I want you to leave me a voice message on Anchor, or you can send me an email through my website and share with me how the emulsion has affected your life or your career. You can tell me a story. You can sell the other fellow listeners on how passionate you are about this new app that you've designed and you want to get a developer to make it and you want to hopefully use the emulsion as a platform to find that person it's all fair game and the video where i talk about how you can get featured on the podcast is going to be the first link in the show notes uh for the first couple uh later 90s episodes until we hit 100 that's all the updating i'm gonna gonna do let's get into the headlines uh grub street has published an article called New York's most underrated restaurants according to 14 chefs. And it sounds pretty clickbaity, right? Getting the expert opinion of chefs to uh, uh, give you some clout. And well, I clicked on it, so damn it. I was going to include it in the headlines of the show, but I came to the realization that I hadn't heard of a single restaurant on the list, which confirms to me that one, New York does does indeed have almost 25,000 restaurants, and that's just insane on one note on one hand, but two, There's more beyond the eater and the ironically Grub Street lists out there. And having the confidence to kind of ask around to people who are, you know, in it can be super valuable. And I know this might only apply to some of the non-industry folks listening, but the ambitious home cooks out there, the people who just like restaurants and like going out to eat, I think that the way that this question was positioned I think lends itself to giving some really, really unique answers, right? We didn't get the cliche example of chefs putting their homies on. This was like, hey, what do you think is the most underrated restaurant in the city? And that's why the results are so fun and obscure. Uh, so I, I wasn't going to make it a headline, but I, I actually enjoyed the the results. So I definitely recommend that you check out the list, especially if you're going to New York City soon. It is linked up for your convenience. In a story that makes me feel old, and I'm not even that old, someone can correct me if I'm wrong here, hype beasts are getting down with Kikoman branded streetwear. Yes, the soy sauce company has partnered with Primitive Skate, and they've done a whole line rebranded with that black and red and gold aesthetic, and it's actually pretty dope. But I think this is a really telling example of what we could see more with other iconic brands, not just in the food space, but in the uh, design wear space, the streetwear space, the, the, the clothing fashion space. And chefs are no strangers to taking advantage of nostalgic foods, right? I think uh, of like David Chang using Domino's on Ugly Delicious. I think of uh, that Choco Taco on that This Place Called episode I posted the other day at Sawyer in Seattle. And I, I, I think especially with chefs' love of Japanese brands and so many chefs rocking Nikes and Ultra Boosts already, I think seeing like SNB Togarai or QP Mayo or insert your favorite ramen brand, right? If that can make it onto some swag and someone calls it streetwear or like high fashion, I think chefs are going to bite on it. So I think it's doing more than throwing sriracha on a cheap t-shirt. Does that make sense? Not like actually throwing sriracha sauce, but like the logo, right? Like the rooster logo. We've all seen uh, people wear those shirts, right? But there, there, there's been no shortage 
of the cliche Reese's Cup shirt or the mug that has KFC on it. But when you enter the hype beast arena, I think it adopts a new vibe. The whole reason I found out about this whole thing was that they advertised to me on Instagram. So are they targeting chefs specifically? Have you been targeted by this uh, advertisement as well? Let me know down below in the comments or let me know if you would uh, uh, re uh, wear this. Um, because also, I'm curious to hear if you folks know of any dope food brand fashion brand collaborations that you're rocking and maybe I'm just missing out on it because I'm not really a, a fashion person. I wear the same freaking t-shirt every single day. Uh, I don't necessarily feel like I'm an expert in that space. So if you know of anybody that is doing some sort of collaboration like that, let me know. And I, I would love to uh, cover it again because I see this as something that's is not going to stop here. It's just going to continue. In a story that I certainly didn't see coming, Jessica Largi is out at Simone after just five months. Yes, that James Beard award-winning chef spent years bringing the project to life, seeing construction delays, dialing the menu, being such an advocate for mental health issues and work-life balance. We covered the deep dive that Eater did on her uh, earlier in the show, um, and I, I had a lot of praise for it. But I think the one thing that stuck out to me was the fact that she had all these grand ideas, and I don't think anyone was arguing with uh, her principles, right? But the point that I brought up was, is this realistic? Will this work out on a PL sheet? And after hearing about Bill Addison having a bad experience and to kind of like uh, piggyback off of some of the other news that's come out, I, I feel like I need to refresh everyone's memory on, on the food side. So Jessica Largi saying, quote, I don't want to build a restaurant where you come in and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I want you to be able to come to the bar and have a glass of wine for nine bucks and eat something simple and have a great time, you know? End quote. And yeah, I know that she had that six seat counter where she was going to do like, quote unquote, crazy fine dining food, end quote. And they did launch a $185 tasting menu, apparently. But coming out of the gate and having so many ideals and principles that you want to implement, it makes me sad to see her leave the concept. I was genuinely rooting for her because if she could prove it as a model, I think a lot of chefs would have followed suit. And she d did a big uh, release on Instagram as a post to kind of tell everyone that she's leaving and she wants to like uh, take time for herself. Um, as far as what the, the restaurant is saying, uh, the reps of the restaurant have said, quote, the mutual decision to part ways was reached over the weekend as Largi has chose to depart in order to pursue outside projects. Effective immediately, Chef de Cuisine Jason Bieberman of Empion and Gramercy Tavern will assume the leadership role in the kitchen, beginning with an overhaul of the dinner and brunch menu, end quote. And I know I'm not supposed to give that many opinions of the headline side of things, but this one really hits home, right? The last time that I felt this way seeing um, Kwame Onuachi's story from D.C., I don't know if anybody remembers that project, but it's these chefs with insane pedigrees, right? Jessica Largi, of course, of Manresa, um, and they've trained in some incredible kitchens, and they launched their first project with their name on it, and it either closes or they leave just after it opens. And quite frankly, I say this hits home because that's where I'm at. Like, that's... It was like reading the, um, it was like watching someone uh, else from, of course, my perspective, but watching like one of my peers do something like this, right? I should be in their shoes. I should have moved back from the US. I should have found some investors. I should have opened a spot and I should have ridden off into the sunset, right? That should have been my story. But I see all of this happening, not just with the, ex the examples I gave, but like, let's take a step back, make sure you're going to do this right. And the best thing is with most of these stories, these really skilled people end up coming ahead regardless, right? It it's just like this initial stumble towards the beginning. And I think like, I think about it like uh, with Kwame, he has kith and kin now, and I'm sure Jessica is going to pursue another project that crushes it. I'm not saying this is the end of any of these people's careers, but I think if I could offer a takeaway from you, it's to know yourself, right? To have the self-awareness, to see where you're at, to know that you have the potential to write your own narrative. Yes, there's value in following a path that someone else has laid out for you. And that's some of the reason um, that we get where we, we, we are. But so much of the stories I cover and the people that I interview on the show are meant to show that or there are more ways to win, right? And I guess the other takeaway would be to... To, do, to, to not do all of your ideas in your first project. I think we've seen that um, go south numerous times, which leads me into a fantastic example of how to do it right. Um, 
and I'm a hundred percent I'm not a hundred percent sure how I missed this news story it actually took one of you folks sharing this with me as um, I was we were messaging about the Sean Brock episode of chef's table and I found this piece and it's from the end of January and it's called quote Sean Brock's sprawling project will feature casual dining and an upstairs tasting menu end quote and for those of you who aren't f- super familiar with Sean Brock, definitely check out that Chef's Table episode. It gives a really good deep dive uh, on him. I also have a few episodes going back where I saw him speak at Feast Portland last year in September. And the TLDR of this headline is, yes, he's got Husk and he's got McCready's, but this is almost a temple of sorts. It's his HQ. And it's centered around Appalachian cuisine, not just food. And so that Before It's Too Late project that I covered um, uh, the last time we spoke about Sean Brock, it will be a podcast. And they're going to shoot the podcast in the space itself. They're going to do an exhibit of Appalachian art. They will have an heirloom seed bank. And there's a mindfulness center on site for the team to keep their mental health game strong. And then as far as food goes, On the bottom floor, it's going to be a casual presentation of everything that Sean loves. So approachable, home-style Appalachian cooking. And then on the second floor, there's going to be a 26-seat tasting menu spot. And when I heard all this news, when I kind of started writing the script for for this part of the show, I got to be honest, I got kind of jealous because it's effectively what I seek to build for myself. Not necessarily with the same boxes checked, but like for those of you that haven't been following for a while or you haven't heard some of the other interviews that I've done on other people's shows, having a space that's focused on bringing people together with a media element and it also takes priority in taking care of the staff, that is right up my alley and that sounds exactly like uh, what I want to create for myself. I just got to remind myself that I've still got time and I will 100% be using this this Sean Brock concept as a blueprint to model my own HQ after someday. There's so much more from this piece, um, from the beverage program to the interior designer. If you're really into uh, building new restaurants, I think this is a really fun article to read. But what I wanted to do to kind of tie the Jessica Largi story into this one is to show that ideas are amazing and having these ideals is great, but the execution is the game. And Sean Brock already has a massive audience, right? He's got significant funding capacity and he's got a clear vision for how it's all going to come together. And I fear that having these kind of nebulous ideals and with great intentions and not it, it, not enough string to kind of tie it all together or connect the dots that's where it falls apart and those strings for anybody listening is like how is it actually going to work how are you going to get from here to there those are the questions that you need to be asking yourself but you know the other the other funny part is maybe this project won't be profitable and that's another thing that I want people to think about is that like you can have these things that maybe just break even um I think about uh, certain fine dining restaurants that I've worked at who don't necessarily make money, but that's why there's the bistro across the street, right? And I I, I urge you to think about that because there's no doubt that Sean Brock has these other rock-solid businesses. He has the freedom to test a concept like this. And I think another takeaway involves kind of getting that uh, cash cow for yourself or that, you know, the steak on your plate that I've talked about before. Like, um, if you have that foundation, so you aren't constantly worrying about cash flow or in, uh, you know any of any of these other people breathing down your neck, that will not impede your creative ideas, and then you will have the freedom to do exactly what you want. Speaking of spaces, man, these these transitions between headlines are just crushing it today. WeWork is launching a co-working space for food startups. What is that all about? So for those of you that don't know, WeWork is known for being a massive company. It's currently valued at $45 billion with a B. They are huge on the office-centric WeWork. Uh, they, of course, have the residential uh, concept of We Live, and then they also have the education-focused We Grow. So they basically buy up real estate in incredible locations and market it towards young professionals. And because the way that their business is structured, they make insane profits on this real estate. So full transparency, they do hire our company, Voyager's Table, all the time. Um, I we I've had a WeWork office in the past. Voyager's Table has offices in Seattle and Vancouver. Vancouver in WeWork buildings, um, but this is the first time that I've heard of them doing these kind of accelerator programs. So as far as how they're getting into food, quote, the massive co-working company w- is launching WeWork Food Labs, a food-centric co-working space and innovation lab that will contribute $1 million in equity investments to a cohort 
cohort of startups. The Food Lab space in New York City, Chelsea neighborhood is designed specifically for people working in food and includes areas for R&D and merchandising, a food pantry, and a large event space. The facility doesn't include a commercial kitchen, though according to Ro- Roe Adler, food, the global head of WeWork Lab, WeWork will be able to help members gain access to kitchens at a discount should they need it. It expects to fill the new food lab with around 60 paid members, end quote. So from how I'm understanding it, this program isn't looking for someone who takes aloe vera plants and makes them into chips and they're going to be the next big food trend, right? They want people focused on agriculture or sustainability or basically the food system at large. They basically want to give them the resources to solve these larger problems. I don't have any thoughts or predictions. I just want this Thing to be on your radar, right? If you've got a game-changing idea and you want to see it brought to life and you don't mind giving up an equity stake to someone like WeWork who has the resources, number one, plus the market capacity, like they market to young professionals, right? If you have something that you think um, could benefit from the resources that WeWork lab, Food Labs brings to the table, this is kind of your heads up that, 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 that this organization could help make that happen. This is a hashtag not sponsored, I promise. The Danish government and MAD, Rene Redzepi's food education and symposium organization, have partnered to create an academy or culinary school of sorts. Some of you might have seen this headline or gotten this email already if you uh, follow MAD closely. The Prime Minister of Denmark and the Danish Minister of Environment and Food have pledged 3.8 million U.S. dollars over the next four years to help bring this academy to life. And as far as the plan and what you can expect, quote, we will begin planning and designing the academy and its course of study. Later this year, we will be hosting two intensive pilot programs to begin shaping our curriculum with an eye on the future, when we will accept applicants for immersive courses focused on topics such as leadership and management, environmental sustainability, and how to run a successful business, end quote. And I personally couldn't be happier to hear about this, right? So much about an education is trading on brand and reputation. Yes, you could join MAD and uh, be a research person for them and probably learn a ton from Rene Redzepi's ragtag band of fermenters and scientists and teachers and speakers, but it's another thing to graduate from like a government-supported and recognized academy. I think that carries a little bit more weight, especially if you're going outside of Denmark, and that makes it so that this could be a fantastic foundation for someone's career, especially if they're um, already interested in what Rene is doing already. So time will tell how the program is structured and how it will evolve, but with everybody complaining about culinary school graduates not being well-rounded enough um, and students themselves finding that it might not be a worthwhile investment to go to culinary school, I see this becoming an incredible blueprint that could be um, replicated in somewhere like California or upstate New York as an alternative to something like the CIA. Um, And that's only because of some of the the points that they brought up um, earlier in the, in the, in the uh, piece, like leadership and management and environmental sustainability and how to run a successful business. For me in my associate's degree program, I had to wait. um, I had maybe like three, three weeks of those concepts and I had to wait um, to do the second two years of school if I wanted to dive deeper into any of those things. So I love hearing that they're including that as part of like the basic curriculum. Um, It's definitely not going to be as flashy as something like CIA if you go to this mad academy, but I think it's a little bit more modern and a little bit more nimble, right? Why would you go to mad academy instead of a traditional culinary school? If you have any thoughts, I would, I would really like your opinion. Um, why or why not. I have got some massive thanks to give out here for the new folks on Patreon supporting this month. I have Michael T, Brennan Y, Joshua P, Joshua T, Sean H, Jonathan W, Chad B as well. So those are just some of the new supporters that have been around uh, for a while, actually, but they edited their pledges to change what tier they're on. So that was awesome to see. If you haven't checked out Patreon, I recently revamped all of the tiers so that there are some awesome benefits regardless of what tier you are on. I highly recommend checking that out. We are on our way to 1,000 patrons as we, as we do. So I really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for everyone that joined the fam this month. Today's beverage, um, as I said in the beginning of the show, I am in South Korea, and we are with Visit Seattle, and they were so kind enough to pack us a recovery package in case some of us uh, went out um, and got a little bit too crazy, sang to a little bit too much karaoke, drank a little bit too much sochu. Um, but this is the beverage, and I'm going to um, flash this in front of the camera so uh, the people watching can see. I can't read it. Um, the only thing that it says on it is drive your energy. 
It is a um, 120 milliliter shot. I hope this isn't going to kill me. Um, oh man, kind of smells like Red Bull. Kind of tastes like Red Bull. Mm -mm. Tastes like Red Bull um, mixed with, oh my god. Whoa, that is wild. Um, yeah, not my favorite, but I think I'm going to drink it, especially if it has caffeine in it, because uh, none of the other places are open quite yet. So we're going to wait to get my coffee. Actually, the coffee culture in uh, Korea has been insane to see, so I'm very excited to uh, do some exploring on that after I get done recording this. Moving on to the main stories, let's get into the, the main meat of, of the episode now. Folks, I totally freaking called it. Kind of. The uh, the Michelin Guide is coming to L.A. And I say kind of called it because my prediction was they would do an entire West Coast guide that included Oregon and Washington State. And that didn't happen. But the real news is that the guide has expanded to the entire state of California. So in addition to L.A., places like Orange County, San Diego, Sacramento, Santa Barbara, and Monterey will all be eligible for STARS now. Uh, the Standalone Bay, Bay Area Guide is no more. It is all California now. This is going to be the first time in nine years that L.A. restaurants will be eligible to earn Michelin stars. So that's going to be interesting to see. The hype says that they might actually release stars as soon as this year, which is exciting to a lot of folks because there's been some really interesting fine dining happenings happening in L.A. And with some stellar tasting menus at spots like Somni and Dialogue and Vespertine, um, only, and I say stellar only from the opinion of uh, some friends of mine who have gone to eat there. I haven't had the pleasure of going yet. Um, but I, I think of the places in LA that are gunning for that three star status, I think it's going to have to come down to Somni, Dialogue, and Vespertine. Um, eh, screw it. I'll give some predictions. I think Somni will definitely get two stars. I think Dialogue will get uh, two stars, and Vespertine might get three stars. And I only say Somni might get two stars because I think they're going to get two stars out the gate, and then Somni will get three stars down the road because the way that they present themselves, I think that that is a three-star place. Um, so something that never happened when the guide had a presence in L.A. all those years ago was someone getting a three-star spot. So that might be one of the motivations why they decided to go back. I wanted to continue with the facts here, though, before I share my thoughts, because there was a bit of a scandal coming out in conjunction with this news. And it's the, the main piece, the main uh, criticism was from the San Francisco Chronicle, and it's titled, quote, Tourism Board Gives $600,000 to Michelin for New California Guide, end quote. And you might be wondering, what's the big deal? Tourism and Michelin, that sounds like they go hand in hand. But the question comes down to certain people being in other people's pockets. And the article saying, quote, since the New Deal is effectively sponsorship, it raises the question about the integrity of Michelin's California ratings as well as its future guides worldwide. Will stars be doled out to more regions in the name of inclusion? And will that ultimately dilute the guide's reputation? End quote. And the reason why it's caught a bit of a controversy is that this is the first time that this has happened in the U.S., but it's not the first time that this has happened overall. So maybe it's more of a documentation of the fact that this is happening and asking these uh, semi-rhetorical questions on the record. But do you remember when we covered the Michelin Guide going to Thailand? That was backed by a reported $880,000. And back in 2016, when the guide expanded right here to Seoul, there was a $350,000 helping hand to bring that to life. So maybe a clearer way to say it is this line. Quote, the funded guides have led many to wonder whether such ratings can be expected uh, can be can be ex can be expected to be impartial when they are subsidized by an industry that will profit from them. End quote. And of course, all of this has been denied by Michelin. Uh, Michelin saying that regardless of partnerships, their inspectors will be fair, as fair and as objective as possible. And opinions from others have kind of varied drastically on this. The, there's this, the writer doing this piece from the San Francisco Chronicle is lending kind of a skeptical perspective, like I said, uh, asking those rhetorical questions, hoping to kind of shine a light on things. There's um, Chris Barnum Dan. He's the owner of Localis in Sacramento. And he says, quote, visit California is trying to promote California restaurants. That's the job they're supposed to do, end quote. And then there's another restaurant owner, Nick Dieter. And he says, quote, is there a great restaurant in Bakersfield that will get passed over because it's Bakersfield? You can't spread Michelin out like that that far without missing someone, end quote. And then there's, of course, my friend Bonjwing, who someone, he's someone who's been incredibly critical of Michelin in the past, and he tweeted, quote, this is no longer consumer advocacy or informed evaluation. This is 
pay for play and it needs to end with you, the consumer, being smart enough to walk away. Walk away in all caps. He says, shame on you, Michelin Guide California, at Michelin, bravo, San Francisco Chronicle, end quote. And that tweet was, of course, uh, included the link for the article that I'm covering here. And so this is where I kind of pass the question on to you. And if you answer, please let me know if you work in California or not. I feel like people, where people are and, and, and where their interests lie often skews their responses one way or another. So if you live in the Netherlands and you have an opinion on this, let me know. If you work at a California restaurant that is now eligible to get Michelin stars, also let me know what your um, thoughts are on this news. All right, so... I quite honestly have been kind of ping-ponging as far as what side I'm on with this story because there have been so many differing perspectives. When I initially heard the news of the guide expanding, I was immensely excited. And then when I heard about the tourism board funding, I was like, eh, that's kind of slimy. But then I did a little bit more digging and I was ultimately like, this is 100% necessary. This had to happen. And I want you to think about it, right? What other way could this have been executed where people wouldn't have been pissed off? Maybe that's my rhetorical question. Like, picture the guide launching in L.A. only. And then everyone gets all up in arms because the original nature of the guide is to encourage people to drive their cars more, right? There's a great drive between San Francisco and Sacramento or L.A. to Orange County, right? Why not encourage that? I feel like people would have been super pissed off if they didn't do that. So it's super on brand for them to include California as a full guide. Does that make sense? And if Visit California is willing to partner with them and they're willing to give them the funds to make sure that they can indeed visit places like Bakersfield, they can indeed visit places multiple times, they can put in the work to hire some of their more experienced inspectors to, and then in turn subsidize those experienced inspectors' travel, is that a bad thing, right? I remember when we had an inspector come by the restaurant in Norway, we were always so pissed because they would always come alone, they would only visit once, and that was kind of like the end of the story, right? How much of the reasoning behind that was the fact that they only had the budget to do it once, and how much does that taint their experience? Again, I don't know these things. I don't know if they were like, well, this restaurant in Norway isn't really that great. We're just going to go and see if it's uh, improved at all. And apparently we didn't do good enough, so they only visit us, visited us once. But the question lies in do they do this at certain places because budget stands in the way? I think back to that story we covered a few weeks ago about Michelin inspectors, and when they dine out with other people, they are probably so much more inclined to have a positive recollection of that experience as opposed to like their boss just told them to make sure they take the train from the airport to the city instead of get a cab, right? Or, oh, by the way, you've only got a budget of $99 a night for a hotel when you go visit Copenhagen, right? My point and where I'm going with this is that it's expensive to do this job. These meals are expensive. If Michelin has 100 inspectors eating out 250 days a year, that's five days a week, and each meal costs $200, that's $5 million a year, folks. So that's just in meals, right? 100 inspectors, that's not even scratching the surface, eating five days a week. That's no flights, no hotels, no cabs, no competitive salary to make sure that they don't go work for another guide or start their own blog to make money. To hear that the tourism board is helping out with $600,000 when that's the budget for just 100 inspectors, to me, that's just a drop in the bucket. And the problem is Michelin Guy was built on this crazy cocktail of print media and automobile usage, right? So that they would sell more tires. And with every single headline that comes out and the data starts showing that this trend of like profit margins in print media is declining and my generation being the generation that doesn't want to own a car, uh, we want to get around on scooters or boosted boards, right? How are they going to continue to stay alive? And that's that again uh, that's maybe a question that that the california tourism board is going to a- answer with this with this um sponsorship maybe it's going to turn into something where it gets a little bit tainted and and they they decide that they're going to stop taking money from tourism boards i see this as only only being a benefit right to kind of get the get their foundation um pay for the first round of uh, doing these visits to all these places um and that's going to reflect in in the restaurants that we see included in the guide Um, back to kind of Michelin's business model, I think Michelin should have created Chef's Table, right? Michelin should have created the sparkling water that gets poured in all the high-end restaurants around the world. And Chef's Table should have created a guide. And San Pellegrino should buy jets that fly people around to all these nice meals in the same way that Michelin outfits nice cars. San Pellegrino should make 
uh, planes or, or get involved in flights, right? I think constantly thinking about how to put yourself out of business is how you continue to stay on top. So to answer any questions directly, I don't think that this is a crushing blow to Michelin. I think this is that this is just some money that they took to help launch a new project where both parties are kind of directly involved and they're sincerely benefiting. Some more maybe silly rhetorical questions. Could they have taken money from California's almond growers? right? What if chefs started creatively using almonds in dishes just to get noticed because they knew that these were the investors? What about if Tesla or some famous Hollywood actor decided to give up half a million dollars to bring Michelin to the whole state? That wouldn't have been that out of the ordinary. Would we look at it differently if... I don't know. Um, who, who do I have? Chris Evans, the Captain America, decided that he really loves food and he wants to bring it to California. Would we look at it differently? I'm genuinely asking. Let me know in the comments or tweet at me. I think that it's just a silly... Um, like I, I think this is just an issue of the press wanting to be on the record saying we called it. If things do get corrupted and we start seeing these different forces at play. The big question here I definitely have is what's the worst thing that's going to happen, right? In this specific case, I think there are way too many variables in play for this to go bad. From my perspective, the fear is Michelin is going to go to a restaurant. They're going to say, this is a one-star restaurant, but eh, if we give it two stars, it's going to generate a little bit more hype, bring more people into XYZ City, and the tourism board is going to like that. And that's why there's so much skepticism. And the same goes for a two-star that might get a three-star. And then the people will wonder, did they really earn three stars or was it a nod to the tourist tourism board? And the reason that I don't think this is going to happen is because the best thing that Michelin has right now is brand. If it decides to go that route to kind of give more stars than people deserve, I see it as the beginning of the end. And they know that they value consumers and restaurants. I think they're smart enough to make the right call. What's going to be interesting to see is once the guy does come out, how are other cities going to react? Is this how we get the fabled nationwide guide that I've been talking about uh, with different regions? Do they just need some cash from Visit Seattle or Maine's tourism board? I'm very, very excited to see where this goes because if this, is, if this works out, I see this uh, benefiting far and wide. Next up, this is an article that I'm actually going to bring up in an AMA video, the Ask JK video for March. Someone asked me a question about private and personal chefing, and I bring up this article in that video, but that video is already edited and it's scheduled to post after this podcast will be live, so you're welcome. You can listen to this and get my thoughts. It is called The Secret Lives of Private Chefs, and it's by Andrew Friedman. It's published on tastecooking.com, and I don't normally like to read articles to you folks, but I got to start with the first few lines here to provide some context. Quote, to become a private chef or an athlete, movie star, or billionaire tech founder, you need years of professional experience and a knack for keeping secrets. A few years ago, Sunny Lee, a Brooklyn-based chef in her early 30s, who has cooked at prestigious restaurants like Blue Hill at Stone Barns and 11 Madison Park, was about to realize a childhood dream, opening her own place. Its concept centered around elevating banchan, Korean side dishes, to center stage. When it became clear that her partners didn't share her vision, she withdrew from the project and decided to step back from the professional kitchen. Lee became a private chef to a high-profile entertainer, cooking chicken parmigiana, steak frites, and other comforting and healthy, healthful staples for their family of five. She finds the job rewarding, and even almost two years later, she prides herself on applying her extensive training to the work. And then Lee saying, quote, the pressure of being reviewed and scrutinized has been alleviated. In return, I'm given this incredible balance of life to pursue things that fulfill me. Uh, and then the article saying her circle of friends now includes many non-cooks and she has time to work out and train as a ceramicist, end quote. Does this sound familiar? This is an incredible example of a snapshot of the industry where things are shifting, right? Careers are evolving. And as Friedman says in the article, quote, private chef and catering jobs sometimes provided a gateway to professional kitchens. Now the current has reversed direction. With commercial kitchens, with commercial kitchen rents and minimum wages swelling, customer loyalty waning, competitors flooding the industry, and self-care beckoning, a growing number of restaurant veterans are vying for private chef opportunities, which represents a sea of change for the industry, end quote. And this might also uh, tie in a little bit to the uh, side hustle piece that we talked about um, just earlier, uh, a couple episodes back. 
the piece digs into aspects of lifestyle and what these private chefs do on the day-to-day. Because so many of them travel, ingredients are more often than not covered. And with so many of the other expenses being taken care of, like rent, it also goes into the numbers, right? So, quote, personal chefs can earn upwards of $990,000 plus room and board for a total compensation package between $150,000 and $200,000 a year. Compare that with the average executive chef salary of around $65,000, depending on volume and location, and the financial appeal is undeniable, end quote. And you might be wondering, if it's so great, why isn't everyone becoming a private chef? A lot of it is due to the current consensus from the majority on the switch. The article saying, quote, Many also have to contend with the disapproval of their peers, like Lee, who still loves and respects the restaurant business and was stunned when several former colleagues dubbed her a quitter and shunned her. And there's another pitfall. When you're cooking for the 1% that can afford to pay a chef $90,000 a year, you also deal with 1% problems. Quote, for one client, Garlaza sent gram-specific recipe breakdowns to a nutritionist who analyzed them, sometimes requesting adjustments to fat, carbs, and protein to keep the jock in peak condition. But neither of them predicted the Taco Bell wrappers Garlaza would discover scattered around the home, end quote. Garlaza is another uh, private chef that they reference in the article. And then there's one more line talking about um, cooking for the 1%. Quote, not to overgeneralize, but a lot of people who can afford private chefs want the same thing. There's a lot of chicken scallopini and arugula salads. Sometimes it can get creative if there's a dinner party, but this is their home and they often want comfort food. End quote. And I realize that this is turning into me reading the entire article. Uh, I'm clearly very passionate about this article, and I highly, highly recommend that you read it if you want to pursue a path like this. Uh, There are are plenty of case studies laid right out, and you're actually listening to one right now, right? I've had an incredible time providing private chef services, and hey, maybe you fall into the other camp. Maybe you're hell-bent on restaurants, and you're one of those people that talk shit on private chefs. Maybe I think maybe reading this piece will give you some perspective and some empathy as to why people choose this path. Um, as opposed to the one that you've decided to go with, right? So the line that I'm going to leave you with is this one, regardless of where you land on the spectrum. Quote, fittingly, the most essential prerequisite for long-term private chef success might be the most internalized, the ability to prioritize and find satisfaction in simply cooking for others' pleasure and to find meaning outside of the kitchen, end quote. So, I did my best to find reasons about this, why this article could be written now as opposed to half a decade ago, right? Like what has changed? What has prompted this shift? And a few things came to mind, and he definitely brings up some of these in the article as well, right? The sudden coming of light of chef's mental health and the distancing of the industry from the hardcore lifestyle of the 90s, right? I'm not saying long, grueling hours don't exist anymore because they certainly do, but it's way more okay now to talk about uh, taking some time away for yourself than when I started in this industry. So I also started to think about the tech space, right, in two regards. One, in this super fast-paced, trend-focused world that we live in, restaurants seem to come and go faster than ever, and it's frustrating if you're a chef and you put all of your eggs in this one proverbial basket, and then the market gets tired of your concept or you aren't popular anymore. And as a chef, you're kind of stuck with that concept. And I feel like that demotivates chefs from pursuing restaurants after their executive sous chef jobs, right? Reason number two about the tech space where I feel like this is perfect timing is we saw a lot of people make a lot of money since 2008. And with with that comes the ability to hire talented people to kind of elevate your lifestyle. And in the same way that San Francisco has become kind of this hub of Michelin starred restaurants, because there's people with disposable income, they're producing, like the restaurants are producing a lot of talented chefs. They can go direct to consumer with these private chef services and basically live in these people's homes. And it's a cycle, right? Because the disposable income leads to people going more out to eat. The restaurants can afford to be a little bit more ambitious. They get more recognized. They attract better talent to the city. You see where the cycle is going? Um, And the only thing that I would caution you to is, yes, maybe this all sounds great, but we are due for a correction in the economy. And I would hate to see one of you leave this great restaurant job to pursue private chefing. And then all of a sudden the markets tank and the pool of people who have an extra $90,000 a year or an extra $105,000 a year to spend on a private chef, that dries up real quick when, when, the, when the economy uh, goes down. So 
I know I pitch it later in the show, but I've really enjoyed talking through transitions like this with some of you folks uh, regarding private chefing through the coaching calls. And I've actually revamped that on justinconnoncom slash coaching. There's actually now an option to do a three-month relationship with me, and single calls are now at a lower price. Single coaching call sessions are now discounted a little bit. So make sure you stay till the end of the show so I can tell you how to save even more because if I can help you in any capacity with my experience in this space over the past few years, and this sounds like a path that you would actually want to learn more about, I'm excited to provide as much value as I can. I'm actually going to do... Um, one of the Patreon tiers, the $24 a month Patreon tier actually includes uh, monthly live streams where um, I will do like different coaching calls, uh, but it's going to be like in a group, right? So it's going to be me live, a couple other people can tune in, and then you can get your direct uh, question answered, and then that will hopefully uh, help everybody that's joined into the call. And then after that is recorded, that can then gets published. Um, so it's kind of like a webinar almost that I'm going to do. Um, I'm, I'm considering it like a workshop, right, uh, around certain topics. And I'm going to slate um, the private chef space as as one of the topics that I'm going to cover um, on one of those because I think that it's something that I can provide a lot of value on due to my experience. Good idea, Justin. Good idea. All right, next up. The damn flow of this episode is so on point. For those of you that are restaurant folks uh, and not private chef folks, Food & Wine published their list of, quote, great restaurants to work in for 2019, end quote. And the questions that they started with included, one, what keeps restaurants from being good workplaces? Two, who is known for being a good restaurant employer? And three, how can we check? And they consulted experts from the Economic Policy Institute, worker advocates at Unite Here, Radical Exchange, and Matt Jennings of Full Heart Hospitality. We've covered him before. Uh, and then also places like Food Lab in Detroit and a few others. And as far as how they did the judging, they excluded corporate chains because they, quote, use a fundamentally different business model than independently owned shops, accounting for about half the country's restaurants. They also didn't include spots that have been open less than two years because it can, quote, takes time to settle on employment policies, end quote. So that gives you some perspective on who's actually getting judged here. So they started to reach out and they were looking for two things, operators that were going above and beyond the low bar set by labor laws, the industry norms, the things we all know uh, to be constant across most restaurants. And I say most because we all know what it can be like sometimes. So secondly, finding these operators that did more than just talk, they needed to be able to provide concrete examples of how they were making their workers jobs better. They also made sure to check for any skeletons in the closet. The space had to have any public hearings or complaints over the past 10 years. Who owns the place? What's on the owner's records? Uh, they do admit that, quote, due to time and resource constraints, this edition of the list does not include occupational safety and health records, end quote. One last thing, and I think this was an interesting point, if there was a scarlet letter on an, on an organization, if they did screw up in the past, they make sure to discuss the issue with the restaurateur to see if, a, if, a, if it was a one-time problem or if it was a trend. If it was just a one-time thing, they reached out to workers involved in the dispute to check the restaurateur's story. So they apparently conducted 60 plus interviews, each of them being almost an hour long. And this is what we're left with. Um, and the list is linked up um, as the first line in the in the um, article. It links out to the list. This is um, more to cover um, why and how they, they, they came together with the list. I did do a quick peruse of the list. I saw June Baby in Seattle was on the list, um, which was great to see. Um, I don't have any friends that work there that can uh, attest to that. But there was a bunch of um, other little mom and pop places or smaller food businesses and I think it's a, a really good move in the right direction so if you want to see the the full list it's linked up um, go to this article and then click through uh, one more I might actually put the full list in the show notes for you and I have to start with a round of applause here right because yes it might sound a little scrappy and a little bit narrow only doing 60 interviews but how often have we heard about a list like this and no one ever creates it right I think it's super interesting to see it in other industries when lists like this come up, and people are usually so proud to say that they work at these places. Anything that involves a competition gets taken seriously, especially by type A entrepreneurs. And it's especially encouraging to get acknowledged for great practices in the workplace because, frankly, that stuff costs money, right? Like, it, it, it costs resources, it costs time to, to, to implement these, these practices in your business, and, and I think that it should be applauded, right? You should get recognized for your work in that space. And I certainly made the reference when I moved to Seattle 
that the reason that there isn't a huge fine dining scene in Seattle is because there's no Michelin guide. There's no recognition or shiny stars to work for. So most chefs don't see the benefit in putting all that work in to see a nice write-up in a magazine or a newspaper. And it's that funny psychology that might tip things the other way, like by recognizing people for their work in doing this, that might uh, make people that much more likely to strive for it. And I know I'm, of course, painting this with a broad brush, but most people won't all of a sudden shift how they operate just to get on a list. But you know what I mean. Is your workplace on this list? Did you take a look at it and, and maybe you've uh, seen the press that, that you were included? Uh, what do you think that they need to do better for next year? Would you seek out a new job from a list like this if your restaurant sucks uh, as your first choice rather than uh, going for the Michelin guide list first to see what place has the best reputation for doing fine dining? Would you look for the place that uh, provides you the most uh, HR resources? be genuinely curious if you're going to use this list as a utility going forward. So definitely let me know in the comments or tweet at me with hashtag the emulsion so I can see it. Last up here, a fun piece that kind of references that piece about the Mad Academy. Grub Street published a piece called, quote, Welcome to the Golden Age of Cooking Advice. Learn how to make anything you want, anytime you want from the world's most skilled cooks, end quote. And it does a great job of shining a light on the kind of modern wave of food shows that we've seen over the past two to four years, right? Samin Nosrat on Netflix, Bon Appetit's YouTube channel, which constantly shows up on trending on YouTube. Uh, they talk about binging with Babish, Epic Mealtime, Chef Steps. Tasty from BuzzFeed, and even the idea of New York Times creating their own subscriptions, which gives $5 a month and access to their content. So look, chances are you've watched a show or two like this if you've managed to find my stuff, right? We're all kind of related in some way, shape, or form. And But they make a great point of the fact that like, regardless of what you want to make, there are multiple versions, multiple schools of thought, and you can look them up, usually absolutely free. And you can watch them, you can copy the recipes, you can see with your own eyes how to perform a lot of the techniques that are involved, and it's way different than reading the traditional paper recipe. And it's also this crazy entertaining thing too, right? Like there was maybe one or two episodes of Dish of the Day where I actually published the recipes. For me, it wasn't about the recipes, it was about the creative process, and that's absolutely going to be part of the ethos of the show when it comes back next month. I hope to be included next year in this Grub Street piece, winky face. Direct answer, I want to go into this. This is um, you folks send me a direct message and with your permission I do my best to answer here in a way that might help the greater good. Um, I actually have two choices here and I might wait for one um, to go till the next week. So let's start with uh, Jefferson Futch here. He asks for, um, on Instagram, Hey, I'm a home cook who is looking to transition into working in a professional kitchen. I live in a smaller foodie city, Asheville, North Carolina, if you've ever heard of it. I was wondering if you had any recommendations for someone who has no culinary school background, any books or other avenues to learn the skills I would need in a nicer kitchen. Thank you for your time, and I love your content. Keep it up. Thanks so much, Jefferson. Um, let's see. I think, yes, first of all, yes, I, I have heard of Asheville. And I think your, your question has a deeper meaning here, right, where you are wanting to make sure that you don't look like an idiot, right? You don't want the feeling of being referred to as the home cook who's uh, trying to move up into the restaurant field, and you don't want... There, 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 there's a certain fear, right, and a certain amount of anxiety that goes with that feeling. And what I would advise you to do is to look at that as an advantage, right? There's so many people who have this experience from a restaurant and they go into a new place and it is so hard for them to adapt because they have no, they're constantly wanting to do the things that they did at their last job or they have these principles that some chef in their career ingrained into their head and they can't learn in any other regard and that really sets them up for this huge learning curve that you might not have to deal with because you're so you're 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 such a blank slate all you want to do is learn all you want to do is grow um and I think that if you can provide that really good attitude, people, chefs talk about that all the time where like, I can teach you all the techniques in the world, but I can't teach you a good attitude. Um, if you lead with that fact, if you just be honest and say, listen, I, I, I'm really wanting to get into a professional kitchen. I don't have a ton of experience that I can give to you, but I can give you my work ethic. And that I think goes a long way as opposed to you thinking that you can read a bunch of books and have all of these. Because the fact of the matter is, until you employ them in a restaurant, it doesn't really matter, right? So you could get really great at um, 
making sauce Sharon, but making it in your home kitchen and then making it on the line for 85 people and coordinating that with the 18 other items that you have on your prep list, that's the restaurant game. And so I wouldn't advise you to go for the book route, but I also know that everybody learns differently, right? You could get a ton of value from reading the books and learning all this material so that when you see these things pop up in the restaurant environment, you say, oh, I know what that is. I know exactly how to make that. I know I know what to look for when I'm making this. So I don't think the books will hurt you, but I would advise you to look at your situation as a good thing rather than being apologetic about it, right? The the worst thing you could do is lead with the fact that, oh, I know exactly what I'm doing in the kitchen. Yes, I don't have a ton of restaurants on my resume, but I'm a, I'm a great cook, right? Because if you're not, don't lead with that. Just be honest. Um, and I think that there, there there's value in you thinking about... Um, getting some of those initial jitters out through things like staging. I think if you have restaurants in Asheville that you're looking to um, get into, I think that there's value in you staging at a place that is on your B list, right? You have your A list, the places you'd love to get into. Find out what your B list is and go stage at some of those places just so that you can get... um, you can get yelled at a couple times. You can learn what it feels like for someone to say that your station looks like shit. You can learn what it feels like to mess up a prep job for a chef to party and they have to throw it away and you have to do it all the way over again while service is happening and they're coming back to you and taking things off of your tray because they're so behind um, because it's your fault, right? Like you need to learn those things. Um, I think that would be my advice. Um, I know that was a little bit long-winded, and there's a couple of, of elements to it, but I think that will provide you a couple of reference points that you can then use to uh, to set yourself up for your next move. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that question. I'm going to save the next one for next time um, just so I, I have something to go off of. I'm going to remind everybody again, I host coaching sessions to help you progress your career. You get one-on-one time with me. You can dive deeper into your ambitions. I can help you make a transition into a new job or position. And you can get ready for culinary school or even work your way through your business plan. So now I have two options. They are available on justinconnoncom slash coaching. You can check those out if you haven't been there in a while. You can use the code end of the show, all one word, and you'll get a nice discount. And that's kind of a thanks to me from, from me to you for making it this far into the show. All right, there is one other little um, segment that I want to play around with in the next couple of episodes. It's called Suit Up, and most of you might know that I just recently became a co-founder in Voyager's Table, and because of that, I'm kind of having to use all of my skills right now, and I realize this dream to become part of a startup and to build something where I have an equity stake, and there are all these resources available, and I get to be creative in and out of the kitchen, and my business partner and I are on the same page with making content a huge part of the business. So I want to start with this segment of the show that I want to call Suit Up, as I said, where I do a little open-faced compliment sandwich. I want to share something that was a recent win for us in the business, and then I also want to share a struggle that we're having or something that we're working on to be better at. So for the win, we were just able to negotiate a contract with a space here in Seattle. I can't say where yet, but they've agreed to make us event manager for their space, which is essentially means that we've just received a constant flow of revenue. So they give us a monthly retainer and then profits on top of that for managing the space. Um, But then that also means that we have a space now that we can use for our clients and for our own events. We have a venue that we can rent out. And so it's been a long time coming and we couldn't be more excited about it. So that's kind of a win that I wanted to share. And for something that we're struggling with, we are struggling to learn how to work across two cities right now and do that long, long distance remote working uh, relationship because... Uh, especially my co-founder and I, we are very good at um, being remote and communicating with each other, but managing our other staff, especially when like I'm in Vancouver next week doing a dinner and then literally a couple days after I'm in Seattle. And so figuring out how to, like we have an office in Seattle and an office in Vancouver and it's a little tricky to delegate and keep everyone on the same page. And to remedy this, we're using tools like Slack and scheduling monthly leadership check-ins. We just had our board meeting this week. And we're making sure that no one's confused by what everybody's doing. So figuring out a way to do shared calendars. And um, yeah, it's just been an interesting uh, thing to, to, to think about uh, doing events and doing dinners and, and growing a business. Uh, but from we're not all in the same office at all times. So that's that's something that we're kind of struggling with and we're, we're, we're learning how to get in a cadence together to, so that everybody can be on the same page. 
Okay, cool. That was suit up a little business chat for you. I want it to be kind of short. I might um, include some deeper stories or some numbers that I can share going forward because I know that provides some really ta tangible um, data, especially for numbers people like like me. Um, but I basically want to remedy two problems that I see in the entrepreneur space. Uh, right, one, and this is personal to me. I'm really bad at recognizing success. I don't like to compliment myself. I need to get better at scheduling in times to actually say good job to myself. You did you did great work. You hit your goals. I'm often the kind of person that's like, okay, cool, on to the next. What else can I do, right? And that's kind of harmful if success doesn't come for a while because you can get kind of caught in this trap of not feeling worthy of that praise once it finally does come. So that's part of it. I think if I can continue to practice acknowledging that I'm really doing a good job, that will provide a little bit more fulfillment and it will give me some momentum to continue to succeed. And then also another problem that I see is this issue of entrepreneurs only wanting to show the Instagram moments, right? The good days. They want to take photos when they're all buttoned up and they're looking professional. And the fact of the matter is none of us have it 100% figured out. And that was something that took me a long time to figure out. I, I figured it out later on in my career that all these people that I was working for who were doing really ambitious things they didn't always have it all that figured out. And I think it's important to share that. It's important to put those struggles on our sleeves and say, these are the obstacles that we had to deal with. This was our plan to overcome it. And this is what worked. And this is what didn't. And hopefully that'll help you when you come across something similar in your career. I think one thing that I do want to do is maybe... Um, make it part of the wins or maybe part of the losses where I don't necessarily just present a problem. I present, uh, this is a problem. This is what our, we thought the plan was going to be. This is what the plan really ended up being. And this is how we overcame that issue. So I will figure out how this gets structured. This might be kind of a total flop of a segment in the show, but it's something that you want to continue see to see me do. Let me know if you have suggestions on how I can present this a little bit better. Also, please let me know, but I'm going to try this for the next five to 10 episodes and see what happens. All right, last up in our non-industry story, this is something that I always like to cover uh, because I think that it's important to get outside of the industry for a little bit. I think that sometimes so many of us can be so head down and so focused on, on kitchen time or restaurant time, and you have such a long commute, and it's like it seems to be the only thing that you think about. So for people who have listening been listening for um, a, re a recent amount of time and, and don't know why I do the non-industry story, that's why. It's to kind of get your, get your head above water for a second and, and see what, what other people are doing. And for me, and maybe this is something that you actually play in your kitchen, it's the song Middle Child by J. Cole. It has been something that I've been intensely fascinated with uh, ever since it came out. I've been jamming hard to that song. And it's just got so many lines in it that I resonate with. And I think the flow is dope. J. Cole kills it. It's definitely got to be what you listen to next, especially if you're listening on Spotify, Winky Face. I just think the lyrics are so, like, when he talks about, um, I'm little, I'm little bro and big bro all at once, right? Where he's like, he's stuck in between two generations where he, he, he's talking to these guys who have been in the industry for a while, but he's also a mentor for people under him. Um, that really resonates with me. Um, talking about, um, there's a, there's enough money to go around for everybody. Uh, the fact that, all these all these young people coming up that so many people are talking shit about um he's like i think i ho i hope that you scrape every dollar that you can while you have your time because uh, we're 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 all in it for the same reason almost right uh it's just how you're doing it might be a little bit different than how i did it and i think that that's something that um I don't know, man. I, th I just think there's a lot of a lot of really good insight in that song. And if you if you listen on Spotify, sometimes you can go in the rap genius and see with the lyrics and 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 get some insight into into what he was actually saying. I just think it's a really interesting uh, piece. And I hope that you, if you listen to it, you enjoy it, especially if you're uh, not a hip hop head. Um, but yeah. Reminder here that you've got a couple of weeks left to submit your voice messages on Anchor uh, to be on episode 100. You can also send me an email and whatever you say in that email, I will read it off. I'll give you a shout out in episode 100 of the Emulsion podcast. The link to the video where I explain exactly how to get your messages directly to me and to the rest of the audience is in the first line of the description. I definitely hope that you check that out. If you haven't already, I would really, really love to hear from you. I sincerely hope you have a great rest of your week. Uh, thanks for your patience with me being on the road. Uh, happy to bring this to you from Seoul, South Korea. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. 
Roll the outro. We did it. You're in outro land now. Thank you so much. I appreciate your ears more than you'll ever know. Hey, by making it to the end, you're the type of person that I want to speak to directly. This little production is constantly growing. If you enjoyed this episode, if you like what I'm trying to do with this show and want to make sure more people can find us, a free way to help out that takes less than three minutes is to leave The Emulsion a great review on iTunes. If you didn't enjoy this show, please also leave a review. I'm happy to take any constructive feedback you've got. If you want to learn more about supporting this show with your hard-earned cash, patreon.com slash justinkana is the place place to do that. I've got tiers starting at just $1 per month. Let's say you just like being involved through suggesting stories to be covered or asking questions to my interview guests. You can stay up to date by following along on Twitter or Instagram that is linked up in the description for your convenience or always available on justincona.com. If you're on YouTube and listening, you can take this show on the go because this is available on all podcast platforms, including Spotify. And if you prefer video versions of things like my interview shows or the shorter intermezzo episodes and you're listening audio only, please check out my YouTube channel to see more of that. Now's normally where I'd say my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one. But you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just gonna get out of the out of the way here. Excuse, excuse me, pardon me.